And in Europe, the biggest problem is you then get to another country and they speak another language. Mm -hmm. So yeah. sometimes I think there's a little bit of self-flagellation here in the US. Mm -hmm. Like I would far rather go across 50 states than go across 20, 28 in the EU. But I do need like, to get you out of New York and take you down to like Alabama, uh, so Georgia, where I'm from. If you don't think there's <laughs> other languages, you are. <laughs> 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 11FS, I'm Sam Mall, and this is Fintech Insider News. This week, we bring you Visa makes Blockbuster $5.3 billion plaid acquisition. Banks tell us how they did in Q4 of 2019, and there's a new bank for the 60 plus set. They put that story in just for me. All this <laughs> and much, much more on today's show. Before we get started, I have some awesome news. 11FS is in the final for not just one but two categories in the 2020 British Banking Awards, everybody's favorite banking award. That's a hell of a way to start 2020. And folks, last year we took home consultancy of the year at these awards. And because we're selfish, we want to take it home again. You can help us do that. Head over to, I'm going to give you a link, everybody, so get your pens out. I'll speak very slowly. Head over to bit.ly forward slash 11FS2020 and vote for us to win Consultancy of the Year, and the Pioneer Award. We will send you a sticker, socks, I don't care, maybe a t-shirt. Vote. We, yes, we're bribing you. Thank you, everybody. All right, with that, let's get on with today's show. Welcome to episode 397 of Fintech Insiders. Oh my God, we're almost to 400 shows. I'm Sam Mall, and today I'm joined by my colleague and co-host, Will White, who just flew into New York from Sweden. How are you, Will? Yeah, I'm all right. Yesterday was a weird day. Can you say anything in Swedish? Uh, no, but I did have something called Julmust, which is like Swedish Coca-Cola. Not to get rid of like all of the Swedish listeners, but it's really nice. <laughs> so it's, like, it's like a Christmas Coca-Cola they have there. Our 2000 It's a long story. Listener. Basically, yesterday I did two hours meetings in Sweden. Then I went to London for a few meetings, and then I came to New York. So and I, and I flew up there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, one, I, one, one at any time. I, I flew up from Florida this morning. Yeah, it was really nice. <laughs> cool. Evidently. Same as Sweden. Yeah, you know, it's, it's exactly like <laughs> All right. As always, as you can tell by the voices, we're not alone. We're joined by some awesome guests making their FinTech Insider News debut. We have Monica Murthy. She's with the business development team at one of my favorite companies, Alloy. And she's a co-founder of How She Works. Monica, how are you? I'm lovely. Thank you for having me. And I love your T-shirt, by the way. That everybody <laughs> like, on had the to represent Alloy. <laughs> and and Borchard. We also have Sabrina Lamb. She's the founder and CEO of World of Money and founder and CEO of Wakiza Inc., which is a fintech startup. Did I say it right? Yes, you did. And that's why we practice. And just so everyone knows, Sabrina did radio and stage and everything else in New York for years. She she's going to rock this. She'll be awesome. Right, Monica. You know how, I look at you and call you Monica, right, right I know, Serena? I know, yes. yeah. You know, how to, you know how to rock a mic, you'll be fine. And Thank last you. but not least, we have Andreas Garcia Amaya, who is the CEO of Zoe Financial. How are you, Andreas? I'm doing great. Happy to be here. Excellent. Okay, folks, let's jump into our stories because we have quite a few to go through. The very first one is probably the <laughs> nice way to kick off the year. Visa acquires Plaid for $5.3 billion. The story comes from CNBC. This deal is worth double of Plaid's previous valuation, which was about $2.65 billion. So, again, let me say that number. They sold the company for $5.3 billion. The company was founded in 2013. Let me say that again. They sold it for $5.3 billion to hmm. Visa. Visa had previously invested in the startup company when Goldman Sachs was also an early investor and helped broker the acquisition. An investor call, Visa CEO Al Kelly said that the purchase would help the payments giant grow its market and forge new relationships with fintechs because God knows fintech or, sorry, Visa has to grow its market because it's too small. <laughs> Plaid's partners include Venmo, Robinhood, Coinbase, and Gemini. This was all over Twitter, LinkedIn. <laughs> Everybody else lost their mind about this acquisition. So what do we think about this? I'll start with you, Will. I mean, you and I were talking about it on the way here. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's, it's super exciting. I mean, good for the guys at Plaid. Um, I, I mean, for them, it's like a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're, they're a fantastic business. We love working with them. What they're doing is super smart. Um, but um, from Visa, I think it's more interesting as to what the what the play is for Visa. As I mean, I, I'm I'm probably coming at it from a fintech end. So for me, it's like, well, actually, Mastercard got so far ahead with all those fintech challenger banks. Um, kind of, it was a surprise like five years ago. So this is maybe Visa's play there. That's certainly the angle I was looking at. So. Anybody else, if Visa came to you, offered you five point three billion, you'd say no. <laughs> 
Hmm. I mean, we're taking the money. Right. <laughs> Let's yeah. be clear. No begrudging plaid that. Like, really pumped for them. Love them as a company. I actually felt the opposite. I thought it made total sense for Visa. Like, I don't really? think... I mean, like you said, MasterCard's kind of pulled ahead in the fintech sector. This is an opportunity for them to play catch up. I guess for me, Plaid was always just kind of the foundation of open banking in the U.S. Right. Um, and the whole point of that is that it is, in fact, open, <laughs> which is much harder to do when, like, you've got a binary choice and one of those two options has acquired you. Yeah. Well, I guess for the, the two listeners that don't know who Plaid is in the U.S., they provide API software that connects third-party companies with customers' bank accounts. So that kind of plumbing, right, that sits underneath. The app's connected to more than 20 million customer accounts and works with more than 11,000 banks, which is a bit ridiculous when you think about that. So I liked I liked the acquisition because it made plumbing sexy. And I think mm. plumbing is incredibly sexy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's one area, in, especially in the U.S. banking, financial services, hell, we could even talk about insurance, area that really needed a lot of help was the underbelly, right? Because when you look at banking, under the covers, if you look under the yeah. hood, for yeah. those that aren't used to it, it's a mess. Mm. I mean, it's part of the reason Stripe um, mm, right. and others, right, have been so successful. Yeah, and Twilio as well, right? Mm. I think Twilio uh, has skyrocketed once it became public. Uh, and I do think that this is, if you look at what it signals, is that Visa uh, is basically now uh, acknowledging that if they don't try something, they're not going to be the pipes, right? Uh, right. If you look 10 years from now, and what they're trying to do in China, which is basically get into their business in, into a China's market, and is not working, uh, I think it's kind of making them realize. Like if you go to if you go to China, no one uses credit cards, right? Like no one young at least uses credit cards. Um, so it, it would not be crazy ten years from now for people to buy through TikTok, right? Mm-hmm. To purchase through TikTok, and they won't need to po- pay Visa's processing fee at, at the, the vendor. So I think that's the typical. Um, uh, innovator's dilemma, which is, I mean, 5.3, I don't know how much MasterCard has done of acquisitions. That's a massive acquisition for a public <laughs> company. Yeah. Like, that's the CEO getting approval from the board to spend $5.3 billion. See, I mean, they're saying 1% by 2001, uh, by 2021 of, of revenue accretion. I mean, that's nothing, right? So that means they're betting on the future and hoping that this is the right horse. Mm. <laughs> but it's a, it's a big, bold move. And I think for all the other startups that are working on this space, it's a big kind of like si- signaling that finally every, even the big players are acknowledging that, that this new way of paying is here to stay. Yeah, right. I like it. It was the really first big story of a new decade, right? 2020. <laughs> now, I'm going to have somebody who's going to go, well, this actually isn't the start of the decade. It's the start of the decade. Mm-hmm. So 2021. Leave me alone, all right? We're going to say that 2020 is the kickoff of the decade. So I love what you just said, Andres, right? It really sets the tone, if you will, going into this next decade, right? Which is reality is a lot of the form factors, a lot of the plumbing, a lot of what we use is going to change, right? This brick that I have in my hand, I have an iPhone 10, I think. This thing's 10 years old, right? I mean, think about that, what we're going to move to, Yeah. you know? I mean, that in itself to me is staggering. Uh, Sabrina, I know that you deal a lot especially with um, the companies that you have with, with a younger demographic. Yes. Right? Can you talk a little bit, introduce your company and exactly well, what it Well, does. World of Money is dedicated to the financial education of children ages 7 to 18. We have partners here in the U.S. and on the continent of Africa. So I love the part about the continent of Africa, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we're in New York. You walk outside and everybody's a zombie. They're all on their phones, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. But in Africa, on the continent itself, this, this is literally... It, it, this, this is changing an entire continent That's and the it. way that they deal with their financial lives and every day-to-day life. Right? right. While we were focusing on desktop or desktop revolution, they leapfrog over that and went <clears> directly <throat> to their mobile phone. So everything, every transaction, particularly financially, is done on their phones. And so it, it, when we talk about democratizing access, which I really, really appreciate that's one of the missions for uh, Plaid is to democratize through innovation and and having this partnership with Visa will give those people met, no matter if this, it's a market woman in Accra or the teacher in Nairobi will be able to have access to you know open banking. I know that's not where they're focusing right now. They're focusing next going on to the UK but to me that's what I see the future in the very near future. And Andreas I like the point that you made about China right? You talk about leapfrogging right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that behavior that you see in China over just, I don't know, the past three or four years of everything going from, whether it was cash, everything is basically a QR code, right? Off yeah. the phone. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I think in the, in the U.S., uh, it is not going to happen overnight. I think, the you know, if you think about credit cards and Americans, it basically goes hand in hand. Mm. Uh, so those habits are hard to break. But I think Visa has gotten a wake and call. Uh, I mean, they're a global company and they see what's happening in other countries. And it's just a matter of time. Right. And they're a company that generates twenty three billion dollars a year, which 12 billion are profit. It's a super profitable company, which is why I applaud their big, bold move on this, because it's very easy to just basically say, we're killing it. We make $12 billion a year in profit. Let's just ride this as much as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. And and instead, they actually take, you know, half or close of those uh, those profits from a year to invest in a company that's not going to actually give them any revenues or profits for the next couple of years, right? It's just pretty bold. You know, what's yeah. interesting, though, is uh, so that, that made a ton of noise, right? The acquisition mm-hmm. they had. Mm-hmm. Visa also came out with another announcement. They've <laughs> acquired VGS, which is very good security, best name for a company mm. ever. Another one of these quiet acquisitions. I looked this up right before I came here. Visa has actually invested in over 46 companies mm. to date. Mm. So you talk about, that's according to Crunchbase. So you talk about spreading the bet and looking for the future. I, I completely agree with you, Andreas. I think for Visa, smart move. And, and Monica, um, introduce our listeners to what Alloy does real quick. Right. So uh, Alloy is essentially an open API we're going to have to correct that. Alloy is an API that's kind of one to many. So we're helping different vendors um, onboard their clients with KYC, AML checks, OFAC, all the full deal, um, and essentially helping you detect fraud and verify identity. So what I like about that, and, and some of my favorite founders, Laura Spikerman, you get a shout out for me because I love you so much. <laughs> um, but what I love about Alloy, similar to Plaid, right? It's invisible to the consumer, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's one of the, it gets back to the plumbing, right? right? Plumbing is incredibly sexy when it's done right. right. We literally mm-hmm. just had a team meeting and uh, one of the founders, Tommy, said, you know, this is not the stuff that people talk about all the time, mm-hmm. but like at the end of the day, like it's a slow build. And I think people looked at Plaid and they kind of said the same. They said, oh, you founded this company in 2013 and you've already made so much money off of it. Um, But at the end of the day, like what they've created is in some ways huge, but in some ways really small. And they had to work really incrementally and it it works really slowly. I think what what Plaid did incredibly well, um, and I've I've got to give the founders, Will and Zach, credit, is they they realized that they really needed to uh, achieve some really key clients, right? They needed some of those names and they needed to – they stayed true to what – the, the uh, North Star was for the company from day one, right? Um, but they realized that they needed to work with large players in order to make this work. Because, I mean, if you looked at recent news, like PNC, um, you know, was doing some blockages they basically around Venmo, which um, Plaid actually is a solution provider for. Mm-hmm. Um, you had Capital One, which wasn't thrilled about the screen scraping. And JPMC re- recently just came out with the news around that you're going to have to use tokenization in order to get in, but they had an agreement with Plaid already, which makes sense because Chase was an investor with them. So I, I just think this is where we're going to go. I don't see open banking being something in the U.S. that is regulatory, that, that, that from a governmental and regulatory standpoint is going to be driven like we have in the U.K. with the OCC. I think it's going to be market driven over here. And I think steps like this are great ways to do it. And I get the last story because I'm the host. So or the last word on this. I, I just want mm-hmm. to, to, oh, please. No, it's okay. So <laughs> we can, like I said, we can edit. What were you going to say? No, I, I want to say is that what I love about this partnership is that instead, Visa could have said, well, we're going to go off into our laboratory and we're going to duplicate what they're doing. Right. And what they said was, and they're sending a market to everyone, why don't you partner as a, they're an expert in this infrastructure or in this service, why don't you come together and partner? And I think that's what's sending the signal for the, you know, the, the coming years. Yeah, and I would agree with you, right? I think Again, I think it's just a great way to kick off this mm-hmm. new decade. Mm-hmm. All right, let's move on to our second story. This one really makes me smile. All right. Uh, Banks announced their fourth quarter earnings. All the earning reports came out um, over the past day. So as we head into 2020, we are, what, really 10, 12 years off of the huge financial crash that took place. And it's safe to say that the top banks are doing okay. (laughs) We'll just go there. So Chase, right? Uh, JPMC's profit and revenue soared after rebound in trading revenue. Fourth quarter profit saw a 21% rise to $8.52 billion, while bond trading revenue rose by almost 90%. I love one of the key um, points that came out in the earnings announcement, and that was that about 50% of Americans have an account with Chase in one way or another. Mm. Those poor big banks, I don't know how they're going to survive. <laughs> City also exceeded expectations on the back of a 49% fixed income trading rise. It reported earnings of $1.90 per share and revenue of over $18 billion. 
Bank of America reported $7 billion fourth quarter profit. You guys noticing a trend? <laughs> and it is a 4% decline from last year, but the bank did see a 6% rise in earnings per share. And then Wells Fargo, their quarterly profits declined by 50% from the previous year, but that's due in part to legal fees and low <laughs> interest rates. Um, anybody surprised by their <laughs> reports going into 2020? I think some of the, uh, let's put it this way, I think this is a short-term uh, bounce from, if you look at what drove the surprise is a lot of their uh, trading side yeah, of the business. Right. And the reality of it is that they know that that is not a long-term solution for them, right? right? Uh, you know, uh, not that long ago, we paid commission for uh, trades and that's gone, right? right. Like uh, Schwab is at zero for the consumer. And so is uh, basically everybody else that followed. Uh, I used to be a, a, a trader, institutional trader, Morgan Stanley in the early 2000s. And the institutional client used to pay like eight cents per share. And four years later, it was at four cents per share. <laughs> and then by the time I left to go to business school, because I realized that business was going to zero, mm -hmm. is now like two cents per share. Right? So it is not a business that in the long term is going to actually generate the same profits that they did in, in the old days. Because more, it was not only that they paid a lot of, uh, clients paid a lot of commission, they used to use their own balance sheet to become, essentially put their own bets in the market. And since regulation has come in and closed a lot of that, those gaps, and I think it was the right move, you know, a 24-year-old shouldn't have a $50 million budget on a, on a daily day <laughs> to make bets. I, like, I shouldn't have mm. – I don't know how they allow that to, to occur. Uh, so the fact that they're generating these profits right now, I think that's not the big picture. The, the big picture is uh, J.P. Morgan's retail reach to the consumer because ultimately if they don't have – that relationship with the consumer, they're not going to exist. And they know that. So like a Goldman Sachs, uh, essentially, and Marcus, and I think that's another story that's coming up, that's their basically life, you know, their lifeboat to say, like, how do we get into that game that we should have been in the last 20, 30 mm -hmm. years that J.P. Morgan, you know, is talking about boring, like mm -hmm. retail branches, right. old school commercial, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, consumer uh, banking. That's really what is the most profitable for them and more sustainable. Right. So I think this trading story is like a quarterly thing. But if you look over the next 10 years, talking about a decade, that's really where the banks are going to continue to be very profitable because it's very hard to, you know, uh, even if you have great digital reach, they're every. I mean, you 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 throw a rock, you hit a chase branch, right? right? And 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 that's a moat for them. That's very hard for anyone else to uh, to surpass. All right, so Andreas, you you, you raised a, a, a incredibly valuable point. This is what I like. When you look at your background, right, which you just talked about, you now have a company called Zoe Financial. You couldn't ask for a better startup for you to be in. <laughs> so one, can you talk? What is Zoe Financial? What is it? Sure. Focus? So is a digital matchmaker between mass affluent households or high net worth households in the United States that are trying to hire a financial advisor. So we provide a digital frictionless experience for them to find that ideal uh, advisor that's in our network that's heavily curated. And I throw the word curated in there. Uh, our acceptance rates around 5% of the advisors we interview. And you need to do that considering it takes about two weeks study time to become a financial advisor. Yeah. Uh, and people use a financial advisor for the most important decisions of their financial life, right? So that's essentially the value proposition we provide to the consumer. So, so this is what I find interesting. And, and we kind of fell into the story thread. We were actually talking about this on a break um, with, with the very first story we had, which was with Plaid and Visa and it's been a great move going into a new decade and looking out 10 years. So to your point, when we're looking at these earnings, this is a short-term thing we're yep. talking about, right? And the point was... You look at the consumer side and you look at revenue and deposits, right, which makes sense for Goldman, and we'll talk about them a little bit later. Yeah. Um, you know, moving in with Marcus, you look at Chase, and just the, I already said this, right? 50% of Americans have a relationship with Chase. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't you, – you trip over a Chase ATM everywhere That's and right. a branch, yep. right? right. But, but, Andreas, you actually touched on a point which I like, which gets back to the technology side of this when you talk about – um, that relationship, right? Yep. Almost like a one-on-one. -on -one. We keep hyping up AI. We hype up mm. big data and everything else. But that really is the holy grail, right? When you're able to actually look at an individual around their lives. So it'd be from a KYC standpoint, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. What you know about the individual and the risk that comes from that. Or when it comes to managing the, the wealth and their assets from that. Or even on education, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Being able to do that. That's really the holy grail. The foundation of this entire fintech ecosystem that we're talking about and all of our shared work is based upon trust. 
If we cannot put our fingers around, yes, it's trust. I love that. <laughs> it goes back to trust. I have to be able to trust you. I have to be able, be able to find you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's got to be transparency. It has right. to be transparency. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So if you leapfrog over and just go straight to technology and ignore the retail, I can go into a chase on the different brand, uh, to find a different branch or someone to talk to, that's where you leap leave or forget about the human-to-human connection that we all need. Well, that's a message that um, at 11FS we hammer. I know David, right. Brer, Jason have said this on stage all the time, where with, with technology, we just jumped right into the solutions and we kind of lost the human element yep. mm-hmm. of it, right? Being contextual, being relevant mm-hmm. to the individual. And when you find solutions that actually do address that, that take the technology and connect to the human, I think you win. Mm. And, 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 Dovetailing on what you just said, a mission that impacts the consumer, the person, as opposed to the owners of the business. I definitely agree with that. There's one other story I want to hit on real quick within these earnings. One other note, I just read this in Bloomberg right before we did this um, story that I think that came out yesterday. Savings for the top six U.S. banks from President Donald Trump's signature tax overhaul accelerated last year, now topping $32 billion. As the lenders curb new borrowing, paired jobs, and ramped up payouts to shareholders, I think we can't forget that part of this either. That from a tax hit, they did all right. Yeah. <laughs> Thirty-two billion <laughs> on top of these earnings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So again, looking out a decade as our deficit trips over a trillion dollars, mm. um, like you said, Andreas, right? That's that. That's nice. That's the quarter. Let's look a little bit longer yeah. term on this. And, and have that view. I think that is, is something we can't lose sight of, is you always got to look around the curve and around the horizon. Absolutely. There's like cyclical stories and secular stories, and a strong quarter mm-hmm. in a booming economy is not necessarily the story. The story is like, how are they going to sustain their, their, those types of earnings mm-hmm. with all the disruption that's occurring of, on their profit margins? And what well, we're, like, just to, yep. what we were previously talking about, like, um, what is actually driving, because the most interesting thing about this is that Retail is almost not discussed, right? In every one of the, the press releases you read, it, it's all about trading income. So, what, like, I, I don't, I'm free to admit that I don't know why. Um, so, Andreas. No, I think, uh, let's put it this way. These are, these are revenues that are going up from the prior year. The right. magnitude of the revenues they used to generate from those units yep. in pre uh, the Great Recession, it's like, fivefold, right? right? So they jumped up from last uh, fourth quarter. Great. Uh, but when you take three steps back and you see what they used to make in 2003, 2004 in those in those mm-hmm. sectors is not even not in, in those units are not even comparable. Right? So these are good press releases, but they don't like sell <laughs> oh, a good, they don't sell a good underlying story. I mean, story it's about one of those like is, is is the short uh, in the short term great because they beat expectations. Right. In the longer terms, like, do you really expect to be able to generate that in the same way that you are now? It's like Schwab saying, well, we used to charge $20 per trade, and now we're cha- charging 21 when five years later they're charging zero. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So we go from the, a, a story about the big banks to a story about big tech. I just made that up. <laughs> I'm really, really <laughs> proud of myself for that. I'm so smooth. Um, Amazon tells users to uninstall Honey. So this is a story from CNBC. Since December, a warning on the Amazon site has called Honey's browser extension a security risk and advises users to uninstall this extension immediately. The news comes after PayPal paid $4 billion to acquire the shopping rewards company. The Honey extension has worked with Amazon since 2012, but this is the first time Amazon is raising security concerns. Baffling. A Honey spokesman said the app is not and never has been a security risk and is safe for users to use. All right. Uh, are Amazon security concerns justified here? I'm looking right at the alloy person here. You security KYC person. Uh, I mean, I say no. <laughs> um, just being clear, my personal opinion, I say no. Uh, I mean, I think for Amazon, it's kind of a bigger question. It just... Honey was widely used, but not perhaps as widely used as it could have been, which is the advantage that it poses to play to PayPal. Um, Amazon's entire play is that they're artificially pricing things low to essentially box out small vendors from the market. And if Honey's able to offer even further discounts on that, like they're already at a loss. It's just kind of deepening that loss margin. Um, so I, I just think it's about that and not really about security concerns. It's been made like very, very, it's a Chrome extension. Like it's very transparent. It's very mm. easy to see what that security process 
this looks like. They're not collecting your data. Um, this is the prime example of something that you can kind of lift up the hood and see what's underneath. And you know, we've all done that and said, there's nothing here. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, and we haven't really gotten any clarity from Amazon either. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, for seven years, Honey's helped users find coupons and other deals online. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a plug-in automatically searches for discounts on sites like Amazon, shockingly, earning a commission off each sale. Um, an Amazon spokesman told CNBC, our goal is to warn customers about browser, browser extensions that collected personal shopping data without their knowledge or consent, such as customer name, shipping, or billing addresses, and payment method from the check page. So it's interesting, going back to our 10-year theme, Serena, you already mentioned it, right? Trust. Trust is the key Trust. factor here. I'm really concerned about this announcement. Number one, they have not Uh, provided evidence that this was actually true. When you go to Honey's Mm -hmm. website, they're still linked to Amazon, and Amazon has uh, uh, published their own extension called Amazon Assistant. Plus, there is documented evidence where Honey routinely goes to have their their whole you know system um, reviewed so that de- to determine if there's security risk and if there are to have them immediately remedied I don't think that that's quote unquote a nice thing to do as, as a business to to um, defame I'm gonna say that to defame another business without giving them the opportunity to correct that what mm-hmm. you've not named mm-hmm. and they have not cited exactly what the problem was and then created their own extension that does what they accuse a honey of doing. Yeah, it's like right. it feels very coincidental that as Amazon enters the browser extension market, <laughs> right. they also have feelings about it where yeah. they didn't before. I, I was trying to, I, I was trying to figure out if they like, cause it does look unbelievably cynical. Yeah. Like that's it just like this seems cynical on like you're just basically slagging off another business and you're saying. And I was like, there must be, I couldn't, I couldn't find any reason to defend Amazon in this tool. Mm-hmm. And also the weird thing is like, honey buys this. I, I, I always pay, I mean, I'm Amazon user, like pretty much everyone in the world. And I pay by credit card. Mm-hmm. I assume PayPal is also one of the payment options. I'm assuming that's the case. So why would you try and piss off one of your, sorry, you, uh, you know, one of your payment? Have uh, you ever buddies? read about Amazon? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, anyways, um, you know, you know what, yeah. you know what though, a little segue on this to our very first story, which I find interesting. So, Going back to Plaid and mm-hmm. Visa, so what's interesting is Plaid actually is uh, the underlying service provider for Venmo, which just so happens mm-hmm. to be owned by PayPal. I can't wait to see a couple mm-hmm. months from now what's going to happen there, mm-hmm. right? And so we start un- unpacking all mm-hmm. of this. Um, for the, for those of you that are, are um, you know, have looked, we talked about this, looked under the hood of the U.S. Uh, financial system and payments mm-hmm. um, and banking, um, it is a Frankenstein mess of a system <laughs> mm-hmm. to unwind all these. But I do think that's going to be interesting to see what does PayPal do with Plaid, you know, mm-hmm. when it comes to this for Venmo and, and other offerings. If Amazon, what Amazon said was true, then they should issue a cease and desist to Honey immediately mm. so that they're no longer linked on the web to Amazon. Right. We will come back and see <laughs> what happens, Sabrina, and we'll bring you back on when that does. Let's move on to our next story. <laughs> our friends at Goldman have finally got a Marcus app. So another story from CNBC. Mm-hmm. On Monday, the investment giant released an app for its three-year-old consumer bank to the Apple App Store. Customers can use the app to see their balances and establish recurring transactions. According to Marcus head of product, Adam Dell, the app will eventually provide a variety of digital services for the bank. He said, our aspiration is very clear. We want to build the best digital banking experience that any customer can have. And by the way, uh, on um, 11FS Pulse, we do have those journeys for the Mm -hmm. Marcus app because we're that damn good. (laughs) Um, Reach out to us to learn more about Pulse. Um, So it's interesting. We were talking about Goldman, right? We were talking about Marcus and this whole reach out onto the consumer and the retail banking side. So anybody surprised it took them this long to get an app out the door? I mean... I wouldn't say surprise so much as I'd rather they took their time than pulled a fin by chase and then had to Mm. retract, right? Like, I feel like that's kind of Goldman's, like, signature style is, like, it takes a while, but, like, when when it rolls out, it's amazing. It's like the Apple of yeah. the banks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, even Apple Card, right? Yeah. Like, mm. a- Apple Card, Clarity Money, um, not doing anything significantly different. Clarity Money is just mint on steroids plus the ability to manage your subscriptions. But just the interface is better. Um, its AI is better. It matches your transactions better. That Like, that's how I feel about just ev- 
everything that Goldman does, they take longer, but they get there, and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's, is, it's strong. Is there like a also like is there a consumer demand for this because it's not a checking account, right? Like. It's like I put my money in there and I got some interest. I mean, it's, it's not like it's not like a classic boring, app, sexy, I know, but right? Like, a, it's like not no like one a cared about app, this like before. You, yeah, I'm I'm a Marcus customer. Just yeah, be clear, same. because <laughs> it's a good return. You put it in there. Yeah. I've recommended it to a load of people. I like the the website, but I'm like like a, an actual mobile app. Like they have it's, about it's not sixty billion in deposits, so someone's liking it. I think that they wanted to wait to roll it out to listen first to customers right. before you roll out a suite of services. No one asked you to. To provide, right? You know, but I also think that they want to have a deeper reach out to those who are innately interested in doing or having a connection to the Goldman brand. Right. I think I think Marcus is pretty straightforward, right? The the, the concept of it: offer a great yield, offer a good savings account, right? Offer a decent product that's easy to understand, that's very incredibly easy to apply for, yeah. right? Yeah, the, yeah. We've interviewed Bo Hartman before, yeah. um, the CTO at Marcus, who put this together, and he said our our goal from day one is you never had to leave the couch. Right, and it was that concept of applying for the loan, of, of getting the savings account, getting a decent yield, and a website was fine. I think you know having the app from from Clarity, a company they had acquired, yeah. makes sense. I, I, I just that was for millennials, yeah. two different, yeah. two different yeah. demographics. But they also what what happens with Marcus is that if you apply for a loan, you can customize how much and when you can or want to repay it. And then if you change your mind, you can change that as well mm-hmm. as opposed to a 36-month mm-hmm. you know, loan. Yeah, what Bo said when we talked to him was, you know, w- when you're going through the application, it provides you three options. It goes, reality, behind the scenes, we got about 20. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so again, but but yeah. don't offer twenty to a user ever, yeah. right? Yeah. I think three is max, <laughs> yes. isn't that the UX yeah. design? But but, but, but I, I don't. I think... always respected. Sorry, I, I always no. respected their like. Um, I always respected the fact that they only did web originally, because mm-hmm. um, early doors. Um, something that's, we always mention Monzo too much, but when I was early doors at Monzo, oh one, of things I, one of the things <laughs> I, I no, one of the things I always liked what what Tom said is he wanted to make it a home screen. Uh, your one of the home screen apps so like one that you went yeah. to the, all the time mm-hmm. and you know the truth is with a savings product and a simple loan product it's never going to be a home screen app but so I they don't... focused on the stuff they wanted and then they were like yeah mobile app kind of when we're ready and we can take our time but i don't know maybe but I'm i don't wrong. think the app is about the savings product i think they've built an app around a product that you know if it takes a while or if there are bugs you can work it out you're not right. because it's a savings app you're not trying to access your money and don't have the ability to do so, right? right? I think it's about the now that they've built that infrastructure, they can start introducing different products like insurance, uh, like you know, yeah. and, right. and different product streams. But they've already got the infrastructure. If they were trying to roll out loans on an app and you were like, Well, I have a thirty thousand dollar loan that I now can't access, you'd be much more annoyed. Yeah. Right. But they've already kind of fixed out some of the bugs, right? Yeah, right. And like take take your time. I think they've done a good job to come out when they have so. mm-hmm. I think there's there's two things. One is the banks are still thinking of uh, digital as a channel. Mm. But digital is like breathing air, right? And and I, I don't think they had to worry about it because the baby boomers were not digital, right? And let's be honest, like that's who that's who they care about. Like the sixty percent of wealth in the United States is held by the baby boomers, mm. right? So they could say, well, we, you know, we have a new head of digital and blah blah, and they're like, but let's be serious. Who pays the bills? Is is you know is the person's about to retire? Now that's changed, right? So uh, five years ago. If you um, if you looked at adoption of smartphones five years, I'm not talking about ten years ago, right? Five years ago, the 65 and over crowd, there was only 30 percent of them that uh, had a smartphone. You fast forward five years, and now 50 percent of the 65 right. and over have a smartphone. So now, if you're Goldman Sachs, if you're Chase, and you're like, okay, now it's like 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 now the money, <laughs> like the real money here is digital and mm-hmm. it's become more than half of them are digital and we like need to launch an app. Like that's like a big deal for them, right? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> so I think they still, it just shows how far behind they are in my opinion, mm-hmm. which is the newcomers, mm-hmm. like they, it's, you know, I, I think of uh, that Batman movie, it's like I was born into darkness, like uh, <laughs> Bane, like they were born digital. So they were like, "Oh, cool! You guys have an app. That's awesome." Like, but, <laughs> but it's not an it's not about the app. It's about the frictionless experience from mm-hmm. offline to online without mm-hmm. the consumer even feeling it. Right. It's like air, right. and I think they're so far behind. I mean, I think it's great that they're acquiring companies that bring that culture, 
But the ones that are trying to create it like themselves, like Chase, realize like actually we have no idea what we're doing. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> like we don't know how to build this thing that's so frictionless that people can't even, you know, like a, like some of the companies that you just mentioned that have been able to create right. that experience. That's what's going to be interesting going back to our very first story with Visa and Plaid, right? The one thing that Visa did incredibly well is they've got a team of incredible folks at Plaid and Quovo who yeah. um, Plaid had acquired. Those folks, everybody I've dealt with, are outstanding, right? Oh, absolutely. And, and that's brilliant. what they're acquiring. It's like Disney buying Pixar, yeah, right? Like they're, they're getting. Talent. That's what they're buying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? I like that. A Pixar shout out. <laughs> All right. they, they deserve that. All right. Before we get back to the show, we wanted to let you know that Finnovate Europe is happening next month in Berlin, on the 11th through the 13th of February. Finnovate Europe is the continent's premier fintech event, focused around live seven-minute demos of the latest fintech innovations. You can network with more than over 1,200 senior-level attendees and gain insights from 150 expert speakers who will be sharing their insights on the future of finance. For more information, visit FinnovateEurope.com and quote VIP code 11FS for a 20% discount on your registration. Again, that code is 11FS. That's a great VIP code. I think every (laughs) VIP code should be 11FS. Let's work on that, folks. All right, our next story. Now we're going to move on to international. We've been focusing on the U.S., so let's look at international, and let's stick with our 10-year vision kind of theme. Hong Kong's first digital bank offers a killer rate. The story's from Bloomberg. ZA Bank Limited, I guess I said that right, mm-hmm. or ZA. Uh, ZA Bank Limited began its trial run last year by announcing an introductory 6% rate for deposits. <laughs> Please open up branches here. That's 3% <laughs> higher than HSBC and Standard Charter are offering. The rate applies to a three-month Hong Kong dollar deposit capped at Hong Kong $200,000, according to Bloomberg source. So if you got two hundred k, you want to get a 6% return? Go open up an account in Hong Kong. The launch follows economic worries that protests in Hong Kong will continue, although so far there's little sign that cash is leaving the former colony. So just a little bit more information on this. Most accounts are set at 2% rate, but can reach up as high as 4% for selected customers. 50 customers could get a rate as high as 6.8% capped at the Hong Kong $100,000 limit. So they, they thought through this a little bit. All right, guys. This is a gimmick. Yes. yes. Okay, that was yeah. easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our next story. <laughs> no, it's like, it's like this That's is just ac- it's like acquisition cost. For, just, first question like, is: right. Are they really deposits? I mean, Robinhood, I <laughs> yeah. can learn the, the, oh, the yeah. tough uh, <laughs> right. lesson. <laughs> There's a difference between a uh, mar- uh, markets trading account and <laughs> and a deposit. So that would be my first question. Yeah, right. <laughs> they, obviously this is a gimmick so that we can distract from the protests in the streets. Meanwhile, many citizens of Hong Kong are inquiring about how to, they have a minimum of, I think, about $5,000 that they can transfer out of the country. But they there's great concerns there in terms of the overall financial um, uh, soundness in the country, even though Carrie Lam, no relation to me, um, (laughs) says that everything is fine. But a lot of people are thinking about uh, purchasing property in Mm -hmm. Australia, in the U.S., and the West, and uh, relocating in terms of their businesses. So there is concern, and this is a gimmick. It's, It's for two months, right? Yeah, so it's, it's a limited And then it's time. going back to what? And it's tiered, right? So, yeah, it's tiered on how much you're, you're putting into the account. How um, do they select the 50 as well? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. like yeah. is it literally just gambling? I mean, it's like... Yeah, it's, it's... You know, we've seen this in the U.S. too, right? I mean, you get 500 bucks for opening an account, and then you see all these dormant accounts, because, yeah. I mean, we've all done that, right? Mm-hmm. And you got folks that know how to work um, the different credit card loyalty mm-hmm. programs mm-hmm. and everything mm-hmm. else. I mean, paying for deposits is not my favorite. Way to gain hmm. deposits, personal. <laughs> I think this is a huge risk. I would not, if, if someone said, Sabrina, why don't you open, choose any market and open up a bank? It would not be in Hong Kong mm. right now. That was my point, right? Because there's apparently like eight new banks coming out. Yeah. And apparently the Monetary Authority has been handing out banking license. Right. A, like now is not the time and that is not the place I'd choose to mm-hmm. open a bank. Mm-hmm. B, like they've also handed one to Ant Financial. Like I don't want to go mm. up against them. Mm. Right. <laughs> That's, That's not the ideal right. co- competitive market that I want to be in. Mm. Um, and I, I think kind of to your point, like the people that are affected by the protests are everyday people who live there. Um, 
with rates like this and those deposit amounts, they're kind of looking at high net worth individuals, people who can afford a home in Australia. Yeah. I don't think that actually does a ton to keep money in the country yeah. because if you can afford that, you're already looking at, you know, private wealth management. Like your friction and your your wealth is already growing at a different rate than like the everyday person in Hong Kong. Right. Yeah, yeah, I would say looking out on our 10-year horizon, new yeah. decade thing, uh, quit paying for customers, people. Not <laughs> yeah. crap off, yeah, right? Right. Offer, and, offer a good product. Yeah. Offer a decent rate. Mm-hmm. Make it frictionless, yep. right? Personalize it as much as you can. Right, and go back to trust. Mm-hmm. Um, HSBC, now they're being targeted by the protesters because they shut down the crowdfunding account. I think it had about $8 million in there to fund the protest. Mm-hmm. Right. So HSBC shut down that company's account. The trust. Yep. Mm-hmm. The trust. Yeah. And so we have two themes for this show. Okay. <laughs> We've got a 10-year horizon and, and trust. trust. But I like that. Those just two work together. All right. So speaking of trust and in, in, in international, next story comes from Sifted. I don't even know who Sifted is, but yeah, shout it's out. It's the FT. Um, oh, is it? Sidria, oh, you go, is. FT. Yeah. We love you guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, the German savings fintech plans a U.S. launch. That fintech would be Raisin. Raisin announced its eye in the U.S. market, like everybody else, after acquiring Choice Financial Solutions, a Spanish-American software company. Choice is set to secure bank partnerships for the fintech org, which helps consumers find the best rates and savings accounts. Raisin's chief U.S. executive said the company's on track to partner with 10 U.S. banks by the end of 2020. Good for them. Uh, The launch is expected for late this year. A little bit more information on this. This is Raisin's fourth acquisition in just a year. Last May, it acquired 100 million euro in Series D funding. Good for them. The company first announced it moved to the U.S. last year. Its initial focus is to help older U.S. Uh, customers enhance their savings. It's also following the footsteps of digital banks such as N26, Monzo, there's our shout-out to Monzo, mm-hmm. Revolut, and others. So I'll ask this question. Um, do we think Raisin's going to fare well in the U.S.? It just sounds I- like they're moving a bit quickly, doesn't it? A little. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's that's just generally been my thought. I think even with challenger banks and such, so many of them have come here and realized it's going to take way longer to launch here just because the financial landscape actually looks wildly different. Right. You need a license in all in all 50 states. Hello. Let's go back to that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yes. Right? 100%. Um, you, you think Brexit's a pain in the ass. You know, come to the yeah. U.S. No, right? really. Y'all yeah. Mm-hmm. Y'all have companies mm-hmm. here. Well, you know what it's like. the landscape just really mm-hmm. looks different. I don't think a major like many Americans don't pay for a savings account or, you know, or even a checking account. I don't pay for either of those. So to to be offered like a premium service that I'll, I mean, eventually in order to make money, they're going to have to charge you for the the frictionless service that they're offering you. Like, I, I don't think they've thought out the path to, to actually monetizing the business or how quickly they're expanding into this market. They don't actually know as well as they yeah. think they do. I, I always worry when a fintech startup goes global like too early, right? right? Mm-hmm. Like I mean, win somewhere first, like really win, and then right. try. Uh, it, it's just so hard. I mean, you don't have the resources that you know Chase does, and now you're going to go against Chase here, right. and and you know, so it, it worries me. As a founder, it scares me like to yeah. to see that that type of uh, global expansion that early. But they come, don't they come from a, a German accelerator that that's what they do? You win, you're successful in that accelerator, and then you are promoted to actually launch in the U.S.? Oh, it was I just, don't a, I don't know. Like maybe Rocket Internet or something like that. I, don't, I actually don't know their funding. Yeah, Interesting. I think that that's, that's the foundation of it. And I think their uniqueness is that they're almost like the honey of financial mm-hmm. services. Oh, good. Mm. I like so that. you can go, you know, download the Raisin, I guess it's an app or a mm-hmm. web base. It's a and cool then, name. Right. But then if you mm-hmm. find a another bank that pays a higher interest rate for a savings account, from what I'm understanding, on the Raisin platform, you can transfer to that bank. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So what they're doing is unique in terms of the U.S. landscape. But there's another company called Bankrate.com. I don't know how they generate revenues, but they kind of do the same yeah. thing. Or max mm-hmm. your interest. I think yeah. yeah. it's another startup here in the U.S. I think that's what yeah. makes makes them unique, and it's okay to make a play for the U.S. because it's not very many well-known platforms that would provide that's that fair. kind of service. Okay, and then you can change, oh, this pays more. Let me go over here on the platform. And, uh, um, ne- uh, rates are negative uh, in Germany, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're like, in the U.S., they actually have positive rates. Yeah, I still, we can win there. <laughs> I, I, I know I'm slow, but I still don't get the whole negative rate thing. I get a headache thinking about it. I think the, know, the, um, um, if I remember right, didn't you go through Y Combinator? I went to the startup school. So you yes. went to the startup yes. school, right? Anybody been through 
any of those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Will? Graduated from the startup no, school, I, I should that. say. <laughs> yeah, I, I find that whole side of it interesting, right? So your, your point about race, and I don't know. I don't know enough about the, mm-hmm. the background for them for doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I would agree um, going uh, country to country is, is one thing in Europe. Right or even no, um, I completely I mean, disagree. Well, you, no, like like running any financial business is hard in a single yeah. country. Yes, running any technology business in a single country is hard. Mm-hmm. Do not let anyone tell you that passporting across the EU is easy. It's hard as hell. Well, you would know, like, right? Yeah, uh, is, for, for our listeners, because they don't know. Sounds this. like you have experience. <laughs> yeah, <though. laughs> yeah like, well, let's go there. there. Let's go there. No, 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 so no where, like, from I, where? Where do you have the experience? I, uh, I mean, I tried to do it with two startups. Right, I can tell you, like they tell you, our passporting is really easy. I can tell you, it is harder than trying to do it. Monzo and, like, and Luke. Just no, so no, it wasn't knows. Monzo. It was actually one that no one's heard of. <laughs> <laughs> we sold it in a hurry. Um, but, um, Nothing wrong with that. Um, but you know, like, I think you know, running a financial business is hard because you've got to know the regulations in one country. Running a tech business is hard because you, you don't know where to hire the team yeah. in a new country and you might have new suppliers. You, fintech is a combination of the two, so trying mm-hmm. to go country by country. And, and in Europe, the biggest problem is you then get to another country and they speak another language. Mm-hmm. So yeah. sometimes I think there's a little bit of self-flagellation here in the U.S., mm-hmm. like... You guys are doing all right. You know, just you got fifty states, but it is a single country. Like I would far rather go across fifty states than go across twenty twenty eight in the EU. Mm. You need to and come I down. voted remain, by the yeah. way. I'm not like a leave Brexiteer yeah. or anything, but I just genuinely I, don't think it's as easy. But I do need like. to get you out of New York and take you down to like Alabama, uh, Georgia, where I'm from. If you don't think there's <laughs> other languages, you are. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I have cycled from Los Angeles to New York. I've I've heard like every accent out there. No, you have not. <laughs> <laughs> Son, but, let me take you to Valdosta, yeah. Georgia. Right? Let me take you to Savannah. Oh, y'all have. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, so so, uh, but I completely agree. Like trying to rush into the U.S. Like I think there's been some criticism. Of, um, there's been some criticism, of, uh, they've had a lot of shout outs there, there's been some criticisms of my old employer because they've been a bit slow about moving into the US. I think they're doing a really smart yeah. move. Well, I, I mean, think Monzo taking their yeah. time, figuring stuff out, feeling it out, asking sensible questions. I know the team there, so I'm like, you know, yeah. full disclosure, but I think that some of the like charging really hard, I mean, it's, it feels like bad. Yeah. Like, I'm, I've always wanted four acquisitions yeah. too. Like, Choice is the fourth company they've acquired. Like, at yeah. some point, mm. I, like, I, it's not that I'm opposed to the business model, but like, how are you ever? This is a M- venture back business. Imagine like merging those cultures as a right. startup. Mm. I, I just can't even. Yeah. Is it, I know they're acquisitions, but they're are they acquisitions aligned with a partnership? respecting each other's cultures mm-hmm. so that you can blend and, yeah. and bundle, so to speak. And I do agree with you because Wakeza, we're doing business, setting up doing to do business in Kenya. Right. And I totally respect that we have to have people on the ground mm-hmm. and respect mm-hmm. the culture and the government, the regulatory and everything, but we're based here as well. Right. Can, I've, I've always wanted to ask this question. I never have for some reason on a podcast. So I'm going to throw it out to this group. Is there a, a fintech company? or even a tech company that you can think of that has transitioned, and we'll, let's use the U.S. Mm. as mm. one, maybe Klarna? I don't know. Can you think of one that you would look at and go, yeah, that one was successful? That first started abroad? Abroad and came, and came here? here. That's why I threw Klarna out there. I mean, is there any that you would go, yeah, well done? I think TransferWise has done a really good yeah, job Yeah, I would actually say, number-wise, yeah. right, when you look yeah. at accounts and mm-hmm. users, they're, they're definitely up there. I don't you guys do great coming the other way. Well, oh, yeah. Yeah. well I mean, Apple let's, and Amazon I'll, and everyone. Well, <laughs> let's be blunt. Marcus rolled out in the UK and did damn well. But, but I mean that seriously, like going uh, east, yeah. you know, like businesses succeed, tech businesses succeed, fintech businesses succeed. Yeah. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll throw happening. one out. Go to Vegas and get in a cab and see Almost. how many talk about union pay or right. Ant financial yeah. and characters you don't recognize. But that's market driven, right? Well, that is definitely market, that's market driven. driven. It's like someone turns up from China and wants to gamble a lot. I'm like, okay, I'll take your money. <laughs> you know, like I'm with them on that. Yeah, I'm scratching my head. I'm trying to think of somebody. I think TransferWise wasn't a bad mm-hmm. one. I'm trying FinTech, to think. I can't really. Yeah, I mean, TikTok is an obvious example, like broader, but yeah. not FinTech. Yeah. Um, We're stumping Flutter, the panel. I'm thinking of Flutter Wave. Flutter Wave is a Y Combinator uh, fintech, whereby if you're uh, a resident of a country in Africa, you can send payments in that denomination. Yeah. Um, and they're being used around the world. Hmm. Yeah, I'm trying mm-hmm. to think one though. If I walked out outside of here and went on the street, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you said stuff like PayPal, people would go, "Oh yeah, I know what you're talking mm-hmm. about," right? That the, the common, mm-hmm. you know, you, not mm-hmm. us. We don't count. Right. We're weird. Yeah. <laughs> We're too close to the flame. I think that's what this raisin is doing from this German accelerator. Maybe they're it. Maybe yeah. It. yeah. That's Maybe. what they're trying to do. Yeah. Okay. You know? Again, 10 years from now, we're going to come back yeah. and do this podcast, and I'll go, God, we were stupid oh, as Sam was man. about plaid. They were awesome. All right. <laughs> Last story. All right. 
finally, I love how they always put this, and finally, <laughs> Challenger Bank buys for the over 60 set, and I'm not over 60 yet, mm. pet who put this story in there, <laughs> and I could kill you for that. All right, this story comes from Fintech Futures. Longevity Bank, already love them. Longevity Bank will launch in the UK and Switzerland later this year. According to the co-founder, the company aims to make online and mobile banking experiences easy and safe for the senior generation. The goal is to incorporate health tech and age tech. Shit. There's something called age tech? Mm-hmm. Oh, there is, and I like it's that. phenomenal. I want yeah, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff cool, on there. I need to read more. All right, and age tech to stop financial exploitation and offer rewards for mm-hmm. healthy behavior. It'll rely on revenue streams such as lending and deposits to fund these features. So um, total transparency, I'm easily the only one in the room that qualifies for AARP. <laughs> yeah, we'll just go with that. I am. So they're talking to me, obviously, for this. All right. This company is backed by Deep Knowledge Ventures, plans to expand to Europe, Singapore, Japan, and the U.S. by 2022. I definitely get Japan in the aging yeah. population mm-hmm. there, by the way. In Europe, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, actually, right? Um, it has yet to reveal its products, hasn't clarified what rewards it will actually offer. The co-founder said Longevity will initially set itself up as a bank attracting net new customers, but the goal is to become a third-party provider to major banks. And as a reference point, looking out, mm. we're going to do the horizon thing, right? Even though we're going to go out, I think, 30 years. By 2050, 22% of the U.S. population will be 65 or older. I'll be Two years ago, Best Buy bought Great Call, a California age tech, for $800 million. I need to pay more attention to age tech. All right, do we think this is viable? Yes, 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very, but very good business. But I think in the much longer term, like 2050 to me is like a fair metric to evaluate the success of this. Like I, I think in the short 30 term. 30 years? Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know, I think about my parents who are very tech-savvy people. Uh, My dad's working in investment banking his whole life, but this man still banks at Wells Fargo Mm. because it is down the street, and he knows Fred, and he's been banking with Fred for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think he's suddenly going to switch, but I think, you know, like, people my age, people a little bit older than me are probably going to want that. Like, we're... But even the, I mean, like, it's not even about the 70-year-old today. Is the 50-year-old that 10 years from now will be the 60-year-old mm. who is fully digital, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So, But <laughs> how many of your friends are like that? Like, it's, like actually, you said, we're a weird a group. No, actually more than you think. So, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I'll, give, so? I'll give you a stat, right? Yeah. So 10 years ago, people over 65, 43% of them were uh, basically digital. Like, mm-hmm. they, were, they were chopping, there were things. You fast forward 10 years, it's 88% now, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, wait 10 years, I mean... Everybody will be, or everybody is going to be 100 percent because that same stat for a 30 year old is 99 yeah. yeah. percent, right? So that 50 year old that's now 50 and is going to be retiring 12 mm-hmm. years from now, like they're going to be digital. I'm I, I I'm plus need, 50, yeah. and you would not believe the number of hours I spend on my Xbox. My wife yells at me more <laughs> to get off the damn Xbox <laughs> right, than my 14 so year old son. Back to the story. You're an outlaw. <laughs> 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 um, I mean, I think it's a really cool product. But I, I think it's a great product. I think it needs a lot more product focus. So firstly, yeah, yeah. don't try and go to 50 countries first. Yeah. Right. Focus on a single territory. Yeah. Secondly, yeah. Um, I think probably refine it. Start Please. in Florida. Uh, well, yeah. Start, yes. yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. And actually, I, I do think that the UK is a good market for this. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the kind of WhatsApp early young pensioner, they all live on WhatsApp and they think they're like cool and special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But she's amazing. And she, but, but she really does. It's like it's, she's social networking just mm-hmm. in a strange way on that. And I think that if you turned up with a very... I changed the name because they are children of the 60s and 70s, so they like to think they're young still. Right. So don't call it Longevity yeah, Bank. That's that, a that bad name. That is so name. true. Yeah, I don't mean to be yeah. mean to them. But the yeah. but in terms of it, like maybe a payment card, a lot of them have now... Enough of them have had experiences of the exploitation thing. Mm-hmm. They're like getting rung up and trusting right. someone... You know, my mum my, my had like a, yeah. a, a front yeah. row seat on this with uh, somebody ringing up and claiming they were from her bank and right. almost losing a load of money. And then luckily the bank stopped it. So if you made it like a sort of simple payments yeah. card and mm-hmm. you you really put up front the trust stuff and kept it focused, I think there's a thing. And change the name. Like longevity. Yeah. You know who's really good is like. Amazon. Like Amazon creates things. Uh, I, f- I remember that thing that they created. It's like a like to put in your kitchen. It's like a FaceTime. Uh, yeah. Yes. And, you know, I looked at it. And I'm like, that's con- like clunky and disgusting. Right. And then, like, my parents are like, we're getting one. Like, right. because, like, <laughs> so easy. It, it's yeah. one button. Yeah. And it's like, the, the font is this. And you're like, okay. But they got it. Right. right They're right, like, right. Yeah, yeah, that's our, yeah. that's a 65 year old that wants that. Yeah. And if right? you can sell it yeah. not as you're like, um, I was thinking a lot of the age tech thing. Like, a thing I think is really interesting is um, like, 
uh, a lot of the, f- the like the, the wearables. Watch, the, yeah, the watch. Uh, mm-hmm. Like my mother has a mess, and if she if she falls over, if she had mm-hmm. an Apple Watch, it'll catch her. Well, there's actually that. a true and story on that. A guy it's amazing, had a right? heart attack. His watch actually called nine one one. His Apple Watch right, right, right. saved like, his life. That uh, was like two no. weeks ago. And and, and then if she has an Amazon in the house, like she could. I'm sorry. I've no, fallen and uh, can't get up. What's it called? An Alexa. Absolutely. She can yeah. say, yeah. hey. Alexa, I fell down. Yeah. Now, yeah. she is probably, I feel like I'm sort of using her as a test case, but <laughs> like, I think that, but I look at all of her friends and they're kind of thinking about it. They're kind of open to these ideas. Yeah. They like the idea of having a watch rather than one of those funny like yeah. things that you had to, yeah. mm-hmm. they felt the like they, the yeah. necklace yeah. thing, right? Mm-hmm. They wouldn't, they would hate that. So, if you could do this as without being condescending, like it's yeah. like this mm-hmm. is an empowerment thing, it's exactly. going to keep you safe. It's not but... life alert. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's life alert like... 2.0. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but so my question just... is, Sorry. what would make them, because they have not announced what their service is going to be right. exactly, Right. what would make our parents change from what they're doing now mm-hmm. to making a leap or a transition over to a mobile opportunity or, or a, a new company? That they've been they've been with forever. What's going to really make them yeah. stand out? I would say estate planning. Mm-hmm. That's you know, mm-hmm. right. Funeral mm-hmm. services. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, be a big fraud thing. alert in terms of maybe there's a voice identity that um, you know maybe there's a family member who's stealing from you. That there's some yeah. sort of voice alert that you know they can't have access to your account. Only mm-hmm. you can. You said very specific to this market. I think that's where they have to really drill down right. for them to make this kind of shift to, you know, because like you said, your mm-hmm. father goes to Wells Fargo and he knows Fred. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. even even when you take this and dive down and do that 10-year outlook, mm-hmm. right? What stops Wells Fargo, City, Chase to doing from that. doing this, right? Well, they said they wanted partners. Yeah. yeah. So, But it's interesting, right? I mean, there's yeah. no IP yeah. around this. What it, yeah. what, I actually read this term. I really liked it. You know, we talk about banking as a service mm-hmm. all the time, right? Uh, but then you have banking as a product, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's part mm-hmm. of the product set. Mm-hmm. When you talk about the age tech mm-hmm. and the health tech component of this, right? You look at banking where it does become the underlying pipes, getting back to our very first story yeah. on the plumbing, where it's one more product in this product set, yeah. right? right? Which are bundled. Yeah, I would say that for some firms, they have it in their DNA. Like a Schwab, I could see like Schwab eventually being like, okay, this is where things are going. Mm-hmm. Like a city or like they just don't, they don't have it. And like they'll make, they might buy a company, but mm-hmm. it's not in their DNA to say, let's reinvent, you know, Fred, you know, yeah. your, like your dad's experience to Wells Fargo. Like they, they just won't. They're wedded to universal banking, right? To do it for everybody. Yeah. So to suddenly be like, to take it into these kind of very niche plays. Is and and of... that's their moat, right? Yeah. Their branch. Mm is their moat. Absolutely. So they were like, right. defend that, you know, they were like, no, <laughs> we will <laughs> never. So that's why I think like uh, Schwab's a good example where they've shown that they will they will literally kill 20% of the revenue mm. because they know it eventually will happen. So there are some big players. I don't think yeah. many of them, but there are some that that could essentially get there first before mm-hmm. before some of the stars. And it's interesting to see what big players are going there, right? We yeah. talk about healthcare and you look at the, mm-hmm. what Walmart, Amazon, Chase, I believe, is in yep. that mix too, right? Mm-hmm. Saying, yeah, what if we were to actually go in and provide the insurance coverage here in the U.S.? What if we were to step out of our comfort zone a little bit mm-hmm. and look and partner and you get companies of that scale right. working together? Now, I know consortiums usually <laughs> suck, but, <laughs> but still, right? If you got the, if, if they're able to pull this off, what our world will look like in mm-hmm. 10 years, getting back to our theme, right? Which mm-hmm. is centered around trust. Mm-hmm. It's getting very personalized. It's being frictionless. It's being in their hands, whatever device we're mm-hmm. using. You know, it's a nice segue for me to exit out of this because believe it or not we've run out of time but we have had one heck of a group in here today we want to thank all of our guests we also want to give you a chance to give a shout out about your companies and where's the best place to learn more about them so monica we'll start with you where's the best place to learn more about you and about alloy yeah of course so i mean alloy.co Check us out. Complete identity operating system. Um, we're really equally integrated with fintechs and banks. So that, that's kind of one of the exciting ways about how we've grown. Um, but I also just want to take a minute to plug How She Works, which is a community for female entrepreneurs mm. that I founded. Really differentiated in that it's founded on allyship, right? How do you bring everyone into that conversation and move the needle forward? Um, and you can check us out at howshe.works. All right. Andreas? Great. So you could check us out at zoefin.com. Uh, if we're talking about your parents, if you're listening and you're like, wait, who actually manages my parents' money? 
you could direct them there. Uh, our biggest demographic is those baby boomers, as well as people in their 30s that have all these big financial planning questions, but they don't have yet the money for someone to manage. We have planners that you could pay like Netflix subscription model, uh, and you could all do it from the comfort of your home, right? So check us out. All right, and Sabrina. Visit at worldofmoney.org as well as Wakeza, W-E-K-E-Z-A dot com. Will, with the fantastic beard who just came back from <laughs> Sweden. Uh, I'm on Twitter at uh, WillWhite11FS. Best beard at 11FS. And I am Thanks. Sam Mall. So you can go Sam Mall on Twitter. It's a good place to find me or LinkedIn. Reach out. As always, what did you think of today's stories? Let us know on all our social platforms. Just search for Fintech Insider. Email podcasts at 11FS.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter for more news and content. That's at 11FS.com forward slash newsletter. And don't forget to vote for us. Again, vote for us. Send me an email. Reach out to on Twitter. I swear to God, I'll get you the coolest swag you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Folks, thanks for listening. Everybody, thanks for being here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank cool. you.